so wrong. So Richard, once again, welcome. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Um, and as I was saying, thank you very much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Um, and I was pointing out that I do often give talks to the public and have done throughout my career, um, especially, of course, as you might imagine, to astronomy societies. But it's great to talk to a group like this, a radio group, uh, because we actually have a lot in common, as you've hinted at already, David. Uh, the talk obviously is going to focus on the sun itself and the solar physics research that we do and what the sun is like. Um, but where relevant, I will pull out the, the bits of interest to you in terms of the radio, the radio emission. Um, but I'm a solar physicist by trade. I have been for a long time. Uh, but I'll say more about me as, as I get to that uh, relevant point in the talk and about my role. Um, as I was pointing out, it says chief scientist on this slide. I was chief scientist at a place called Ralph Space, which is at the Rutherford, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And I'll describe that lab later on. Um, and I'm not chief scientist now because I actually retired at the end of December, uh, having had that role for many years. But again, more about me later on. But uh, I want to go right back now to the early days, as it were, and the first flare. And when I say the first flare, I don't really mean the first flare. I mean the first one that was seen by humans. Um, and this was on the 1st of September 1859, and it became known as the Carrington event. And it was actually observed by two people, uh, Richard Carrington and somebody called Richard Hodgson, at the same time. And they both reported it independently to the Royal Astronomical Society, which actually is a good move scientifically, so, so that you can um, confirm the observations. What they saw was actually what we call a white light flare, which is actually quite unusual. It's a You don't normally see... The visible sun and, and and pick out a flare. A flare is usually not that bright and visible light enough to be able to be seen against the disc. In this case, they were both making observations of that sunspot group that you see there. Um, those sunspots were drawn in this case by Richard Carrington, and there are four spots on there labeled A, B, C, and D, and they're bright white features that were on the disc that he noticed but that he'd never seen before. It might look pretty insignificant, but it isn't. For something to be that bright, to be seen against a disc like that, was, was quite significant. And then the days following, there was a um, the, the event was associated with global auroral displays on the Earth, even to low latitudes, and there were even fires due to sparking in telegraph stations. And these are the sorts of things that will become clearer later on in, in the talk. Um, so it's actually quite a significant event. Something obviously happened that influenced the Earth. And the Carrington event itself is really used as a benchmark for extreme solar events. And such an event cause, you know, now would cause a major disruption, disruption to human activities and, and our infrastructure. Moving on, though, from the first flare, there's another creature, if you like, in terms of solar activity um, called a coronal mass ejection, which is a dreadful name for anything. We often call them CMEs. And the reason why I focus on this one a little bit is because people often get confused and think of these as flares as well. I don't know how many times you see in the press an e event has been reported and they say there's a solar flare approaching the Earth. Well, no, there isn't. There's a coronal mass ejection approaching the Earth. They're not the same. And the first one of these was noted on the 13th, 14th of December um, 1972 from one of the OSO spacecraft. OSO is the Orbiting Solar Observatory. And notice that the person who reported it was somebody called Richard Towsey. So in the first two slides, you've had three Richards there. And obviously that's my name as well. So clearly I'm in the right, you know, really in good company here. And the point about this is that what they saw was a large expulsion of matter in, from the sun into interplanetary space. Hence the name coronal mass ejection. Corona is the atmosphere of the sun. And on those slides, all those images you see there, um, the top left hand one shows you, or if you focus on the top left hand one initially, uh, the top right hand corner of that, you'll see in the corner of a disc, the corner, the quadrant of a disc that's actually blocking off the sun like an artificial eclipse. It, the image isn't clear, of course. It's, it's pretty old, of course, as well. Um, and you can see brightness above it as you move away from the sun. And you look at the other three frames on there, you can see the brightness changes and you can see some structure in there as well. And the people making those obs observations were pretty pretty clear that you could see something coming out from the sun in those those images. 
it's not great in a sense, uh, but obviously it's very significant and they clearly made a discovery. Now I'm going to show you one more of the, the old data, as it were, before I show you what they look like now. And this one is probably of real interest to you. In the, it's, as, as far as I know, the first detection of radio emission directly from the sun made in 1942. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody in the group knows something that I don't know. <laughs> and will say, actually, you know, <laughs> it was 1941 or something, whatever. Uh, and there might well be somebody who can can uh, correct me there. It would be fascinating to know if you, you have any more information that, uh, that uh, I, I don't know about. But as far as I'm aware, it, it was noted by British radar operators in 1942 during World War II. It wasn't published until 1946. It was published by Hay in, in the journal Nature. And the reason for the delay was the desire to keep it secret, potentially because it was useful for evading enemy radar. Um, as a result, it means that the first publication of radio emission from the sun was actually made in 44 in the States uh, in the journal Astro Astrophysical Journal. Um, but let me now jump to today, because this is what we see, um, you know, what we see now with modern technology, as it were. And, and I'm going to run this as a movie. You might, some of you might have never seen images like this, in which case you might be quite struck by them. Others may well have seen many of these uh, because they're, they're pretty popular these days. And it's one of these things that looks as though it's made up in a sense. You know, it's, it's um, CGI or something. It's not. It's real. Um, these are images of the sun, in this case, taken in extreme ultraviolet light. And you're looking effectively at the sun's corona, the sun's atmosphere, the outer atmosphere. The lower atmosphere is called the chromosphere. The outer atmosphere is called the corona in very simple terms. And the corona reaches temperatures of millions of degrees. Um, and in the sun, you're talking about a situation where the temperatures are high enough for the gases to be, because the sun is basically a ball of gas, if you like, but it's super hot gas. You get millions of degrees in terms of temperatures. And so it becomes highly ionized, if you like. The electrons are separated from the ions, um, they're, they're, they're ripped apart. So you're basically talking about a situation where the magnetic field lines, that's what you're seeing there, the magnetic field lines that are generated by the motions of these plasmas are actually confining the plasmas, in a sense, to loops that you can see before your eyes, a little bit like the old iron filings experiment at school, where you could see the shape of the magnetic field of a magnet. But because the sun is turbulent, because it's got what we call differential rotation, because uh, the sun rotates at a different speed depending on the, the latitude, the, these magnetic fields that you see just get tied up in knots and uh, the sun gets more and more angry in a sense and you get lots of these so-called active regions that you can see there. Um, and there are times when that will break down, but you're not seeing any flares there. You're just seeing the sun's corona getting angry, looking very different to anything you've seen in your life anywhere else. And these are just huge magnetic loop systems in the sun's atmosphere, as I say, trapping these super hot plasmas. Um, as you can imagine, I, I mean, I mentioned that it was extreme ultraviolet light that we're looking at. These plasmas radiate, and there are particular what we call emission lines in the ultraviolet that allow us to determine what the gases there are made of, how hot they are, and so on. So we know we're looking at the million degree plasma, and in this frame, we're actually looking at, at iron highly ionized iron emitting. So what have you got here? You've got plasmas confined in magnetic loops, and that's going to be something that might excite you for reasons that I'll say in a few minutes. Just run another one of those because they're so uh, beautiful to look at. These are taken by a spacecraft called the Solar Dynamics Observatory, SDO. It's a NASA mission. All the experiments on the mission uh, were developed in the USA, but all of the camera systems came from the UK, so we can be quite proud of the UK involvement in that mission. So what about the flare then? I mentioned a flare a few minutes ago uh, and showed you um, an example of the Carrington event. Uh, what do they look like now? How do we see them? Bottom line is you take one of those active regions that you've just seen. Here is an example of one taken in a slightly different light, but it's extreme ultraviolet light. Again, you can see the edge of the sun. The earth would be about half the size of that box with the date on it, bottom left-hand side of the frame. I'm going to run it as a movie, of course, and this was taken from a spacecraft called Trace. This is a flare. A flare is basically a huge explosion where those 
highly stressed magnetic fields simply ignite the plasmas in there. The, the energy from those magnetic fields is basically released to the plasmas, uh, which get heated to ridiculous temperatures, maybe tens of millions of degrees. And you get emission from radio all the way through the gamma rays. Um, and of course, as you could imagine, um, I mean, these are like the, the the solar equivalents of earthquakes, if you like. Um, so you can imagine they're all different and they're hard to predict. Um, and uh, but, but this is a beautiful example. And I, for those of you that like the numbers, 10 to the 25 joules of energy released in tens of minutes. Um, and you can see how that compares to the Hiroshima atomic bomb there at the bottom. So these are energies and temperatures that you can't really imagine. When you think the Earth is only half the size of that box as well, you can't imagine that either. So that's really what the sort of thing we look at now in terms of solar flares. What about these coronal mass ejections? Well, if you like an earthquake and a volcano, if you like, a bit like these two, in solar terms, this is the volcano, <laughs> this is the eruption. Um, so they, they can be related, they often are related, but they're not the same thing at all. So this is one of these coronal mass ejections where you can have a huge cloud erupting into space at up to a couple of thousand kilometers per second, um, releasing a, a billion tons basically in one go. Um, and you can have up to a few a day at solar maximum. So if you look at the right hand frame there, you can see where the sun is, it's the white circle. This was taken from a spacecraft called SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. And most of the stuff you see in that frame is basically that magnetic field of the sun's atmosphere extending out or stretching out into space, even defining the environment we live in. Um, and that thing going off at the top left-hand side of that frame is one of these coronal mass ejections. You saw a very fuzzy version of one of those from that OSO observation early on. Um, and that looks like a big loop, doesn't it, as it comes out. And you can easily imagine that that is basically a huge magnetic loop system of the sorts that you just saw just erupting out into space, just deciding it's unstable and flying off into space, which is effectively what's happening. And as I say, that's about a billion tons going out in one go. And the left-hand frame, same spacecraft, somebody's conveniently put the sun in the middle there in a different form of ultraviolet light so that you can see where the active regions are. And you can see a whole load of those events flying off the sun. These are obviously speeded up, as you probably imagine, sorry. Um, so you can see the, the time, in particular, on the one on the right. So spectacular events. Just incidentally, from a radio point of view, just looking at that event on the right-hand side, if that's traveling out at 1,000 kilometers per second and crossing through regions of, of plasmas that um, clearly have a plasma frequency, which is the sort of thing you might be very familiar with, clearly it's going to excite plasma frequencies that are going to vary in frequency depending on the density, which will decrease as the shock comes out from the sun. So you see those signatures in radio. We're associated with those coronal mass ejections. Often there's a thing at the bottom following it, which is called a prominence eruption, uh, which you can see when you look at the solar disk like this, which is again in ultraviolet light, but it's looking at this chromospheric layer I talked about, which is lower down. It looks more like an orange than the sun, but it is real again. And a lot of the mottled patterns are basically, if you like, you looking down on the the um, convection cells almost effectively, or the pattern that's related to that, um, like looking down on a pan of boiling water. And if I run it as a movie, though, you'll see something rather dramatic happening here. Um, I mentioned there are prominences that erupt as part of these coronal mass ejections. Well, this one is probably the most dramatic one I've ever seen. The the mass ejection itself is the big loop thing that is not visible in this, this set of frames at all. This this bit of eruption is part of it, if you like. And, and this sequence is just wonderful. It look, again, it looks as though somebody's made it up. Um, and you can see a lot of it just raining back down on the sun. So in terms of radio emission then, what have we got? Um, well, you're talking about plasmas. So you've got electrons, you've got protons, you've got ions spiraling around magnetic field lines, and loops combined with your explosions, solar flares that I showed you, and even the clouds flying out. This is a wonderful soup for the production of radio um, from your point of view. Um, I'm sure many of you are looking at this and thinking, wow, yeah, <laughs> what a source to play with. Um, and there are many ways that the sun can produce radio emission. I've hinted at a few already, but these are the sorts of processes that kind of dominate what we see in terms of radio. 
and might have effects that you're familiar with or would affect you in a sense, I suppose. Um, for example, I mean, these are some of you may be familiar with these, so I will comment on them. Um, but but uh, again, don't ask too many questions about this. I'm not really a radio person, but <laughs> thermal Bramstrahlung, I'm certainly familiar with in terms of emission as well. You've got beams impacting denser regions in the sun's atmosphere because uh, clearly with those big loops you saw erupting in the flare you can imagine streams of particles flying down those loops down to the denser regions towards the sun itself again spiraling mag uh, particles around magnetic field lines this gyromagnetic emission is going to be seen the plasma emission i mentioned already where you just excite the plasma frequencies by throwing uh, shocks through um the plasmas or, or the, you know, these explosive events or whatever in response to them. And the electron cyclotron maser emission is, is basically due to the higher energy particles that you see related a little bit to the gyromagnetic emission. So there are processes that you see. But even when you reach the Earth, you get things like ionospheric scintillation, which is something some of you might well be familiar with. And you know, basically is interference of radio waves. Um, due to small-scale plasma, particularly when coronal mass ejections arrive at the Earth. There's a whole soup of things to play with then. So maybe it's a good point then to ask, who am I? Because um, I'm going to go on to talking about the missions a little bit and the place that I come from and what we do. Um, I've been a solar physicist for 44 years. Um, I was originally at the University of Birmingham. If you look at the three frames on the left, that's the one at the top. Um, and then went to the high altitude observatory in Boulder, Colorado, which is a fantastic place to work just into the Rockies. Uh, but from 1986, I was at the Rutherford Afton Laboratory. That's the, the lab bottom left um, as it is now. Um, and I'll explain what that is in, in a while. But from 1986 until the end of last year, I was there. So that's 37 years, I guess. Um, and the three missions during my time of those three places, not one at each, but um, they sort of span the, you know, it's the same community working on these things. But the three major missions I worked on are the three launches I list at the bottom there. The first one was called Solar Maximum Mission, working with NASA from 1980 to 1989. Um, but the other two are particularly important to me, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory called SOHO, which is a European Space Agency mission, and STEREO, which is a NASA mission launched in 2006. And both STEREO and SOHO are still operational. But for both of those two, I had the honor of being able to lead one of the instruments that, that's flying on those spacecraft, which I'll mention you know, in a while. So that's sort of my career in a nutshell, although there's a lot of other things that clear, clearly I haven't mentioned. But thinking about that, that uh, slide, I started in 1980. And in 1980, there was one big solar mission about to fly, called Solar Maximum Mission. That's the one that just showed you the launch on the left-hand side of those three. It was launched in 1980. I was involved with an instrument actually led from Holland, but involving the University of Birmingham. But we basically had one spacecraft studying the sun. We were flare hunting. It was a flare hunting mission. The idea was to understand flares on the sun. Some of you might remember Solar Maximum Mission or Solar Max, people like to call it, or SMM. It was the first spacecraft to be repaired in the back of the shuttle, hence the image on the right-hand side. You don't often see your spacecraft again but it was basically a convenient spacecraft to repair before they started thinking about how to repair the shuttle the sorry the, the uh, hubble space um, telescope um, it was easy to you know if you like this spacecraft wouldn't have mattered quite so much but it was uh, a really useful exercise and actually good for solar physics and in those days we had planning meetings every day where we'd look at an image like the sketch in the middle there um, and a group telling us what they thought the possibilities were for one of the active regions to actually have a flare in the next 24 hours so we could point the spacecraft at that particular region and invariably the flares occurred somewhere else. Um, but actually it did work occasionally, but it was um, the sun was relatively quiet for that solar maximum mission. Uh, but having said that, there was lots of interesting stuff going on. We certainly caught quite a few flares, but the thing that caught my eye was the fact was this and you, you know what that is it's a coronal mass ejection point about that was that from my point of view the flares were okay they were interesting but here was something that had been discovered in the, just a few years before flying off the sun like some monster cloud erupting what's at the base of that what what caused that to erupt and a lot of my research in subsequent years for some years actually some years a couple of decades 
uh, was really focusing on what happens there. What what are these coronal mass ejections? Where do they come from? Um, and in latter years, how do they impact the Earth? And the interesting thing, those two sketches at the top, shows you what it was like because, okay, this is 1979-1980. I started in a day of contour plotting, sketching. You wouldn't put a sketch like that at top left hand one in a professional publication now in quite the same way at all, but that's how it was in those days. And uh, now compare that to the movies and things you've seen in the last few slides. Uh, which are those are the things we publish now and uh, a lot of complex analyses which um, we wouldn't have had a chance of trying to do in those days so things really have moved on just pause briefly then um why study the sun is an interesting thing to ask in particular before we move on and think about what we're doing these days and really there are three reasons i suppose one is it's the only star we can study in detail and i really do mean in detail and you've seen some of that already um and of course, as part of that, it's worth just pointing out that people can relate to the sun. Everybody knows what it is. So when you're giving a talk um, about the sun and how it works, there is quite a bit of interest. I find it, I don't know the word is difficult or what. It's, it, if I was a particle physicist, I think I'd find it harder to try and explain what a proton is or an electron is or a neutron is to an audience. But they know what the sun is and can latch onto that immediately, which is always very useful for me. One of the things you've seen already is that a lot of fundamental processes occur on the sun, certainly in terms of plasma physics and so on. So it's like a laboratory where you can see processes at work that you can't recreate on the Earth. And so there's a lot of physics that's really useful there. And the third thing is space weather, which I will talk about towards the end. And space weather is one of those things where the sun actually impacts us and impacts our activities, impacts, impacts elements of our infrastructure and it's something we need to worry about and it's it's the environment around the earth as driven by the sun if you like and the impacts of that and it's becoming an extremely important field so with all of these things then as a major international effort which means that that one spacecraft in 1980 has now become a fleet um, we're talking about a strategy on a global sense uh, which has grown up over the subsequent decades and I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but I'll mention a few points because this is what we have now. Near the Earth, you've got two Earth orbiting missions, um, SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. You've seen some images from that already, real high resolution images of the sun's atmosphere. Now, that was those um, magnetic field images that you've seen that look like elastic bands. Hinode is a Japanese mission, also a big observatory. Though. So those are the big high resolution missions that need huge amounts of telemetry. And as a result, it's better for them to be near the Earth. So they're orbiting Earth. Um, but um, there are other breeds, if you like, other types of spacecraft. SOHO, I've mentioned already, the Solar and the Aspheric Observatory, is like a kind of a solar battleship. It's um, a flagship, certainly, um, with a whole bunch of international instruments. It's stationed at the L1 point, which is the point where the gravitational pull of the Earth and the Sun form a balance. It's four times further out than the moon. You can actually orbit that point. You don't have to orbit the Earth. You can orbit that point in space in front of the Earth all the time, pointed towards the sun, which is a fantastic place for a solar mission to be. And it's on that mission I was very lucky to be able to lead an instrument that was launched in 1995. Uh, a little bit more about that later on. Um, and that's remained a major sort of flagship mission. But the two stereo missions, uh, spacecraft, you can see there, Stereo A and Stereo B, kind of, they, they kind of left the cradle, if you like. It's the time that we had solar missions that left the Earth and looked back towards the Earth and the Sun and the space between the two. They actually orbit the Sun. One of them's not operational now, but the other one's still going strong. By flying out of the Sun-Earth line, by orbiting the Sun, you can look back and see what is heading towards the Earth. And I'll show you some of that later on. And it's actually relevant, of course, to you in some of your radio work. Um, so those are quite important missions from that point of view. They're like a different um, you know, level, a different approach to life, in a sense, by leaving the cradle, as it were. And then you've got the two missions approaching the Sun. These are encounter missions. You're not going to land on the Sun like you could on Mars when we talk about planetary encounter missions, where we have solar encounter missions. And there are two there. One is called Parker Solar Probe, which is the NASA mission that goes in about 10 solar radii of the sun, 
gets really close. It's so close you can't image the sun from it. You can sample the environment around the spacecraft. There's one instrument that looks out sideways, um, but you can't actually see the sun from it. And it's the closest thing we've ever got to the sun. Um, and then there's the European Space Agency's solar orbiter, which just gets within the orbit of Mercury. So it's very close to the sun, but so, so it's close enough to still be able to image. But you've got you know, phenomenal thermal problems to deal with, but it works. You can actually image the sun. So Solar Orbiter and Parker Solar Probe work hand in hand, NASA and ESA together. Um, and I'm particularly proud of Solar Orbiter in particular because I was one of the proposers of the mission. Uh, and I'll show you some data from that. So those encounter missions are really in their prime now. And this is the fleet that we have as an international group. You know, it's multinational. It's not just NASA and European Space Agency. So just just briefly, and I'm just indulging myself a little bit here, but this, yeah, that is me, bottom left, sorry, left hand side, many, many years ago, and grief, 1995 with the Soho spacecraft on the launch pad, the Soho launch, and to give you an idea of the scale of the instrument, that's the engineering model of the instrument on the right hand side for that one. And that is an ultraviolet spectrometer, so it looks into the loop structures that you saw earlier on, the plasmas that are emitting from the sun. And by splitting up the light that you receive, you can actually determine what the temperatures, densities, abundances of different elements are in the sun's atmosphere for all those loops and things that you saw in those images. So it's like a, a solar weather instrument almost and allows you to really put the physics into it. And one of the beauties of it is it's operated, it still is, from the Goddard Space Flight Center in the USA near Washington. Um, and it's a hands-on operation. In other words, we make our own observations as the instrument teams. We command our own instruments on a daily basis. Uh, we actually had a facility at Rutherford to do it ourselves from home as well. You don't often get that luxury. You could literally choose what to observe on a particular day and do it yourself, um, which is a fantastic honor. The other mission I mentioned where I was leading an instrument is aboard Stereo. Now that instrument you saw a second ago, this thing in front of us here weighed 100 kilograms and it's almost as big as me. The instrument on stereo is that black thing. That's a model of it on the left hand frame. You can see the people next to it, including me. Very different instrument. Um, you know, you're looking, you're trying to make light instruments at a, about 15 kilograms in this case. Um, so this is not, the last one was aluminium. This is um, CFRP, carbon fiber reinforced plastic, basically, and carbon fiber blades. Um, basically designed with two cameras hidden within a, a baffle system so you could look across the sun earth line not blinded blinded so not blinded by the sun's light so you could pick out these clouds the coronal mass ejections flying through space and there's an image of one of those on the right hand side so uh, again a uh, wonderful thing to be involved with i'm just going to go back again to solar dynamics observatory I've already shown you some images, but I'll show you another sort of image here. This is another thing that um, we see. The sun's quite quiet in this frame, but um, a lot of things which, well, on there, we have this wonderful way of naming things, don't we? Things called bright points is, is something we talk about in solar physics, like little mini active regions. But the thing you can't miss is that dark thing, which comes down from the North Pole all the way down to the equator. And it's dark also at the bottom there. And these are coronal holes. Um, and from a magnetic point of view, this is where the magnetic field lines are just open to space and particles can come streaming out into space from those. So that's a different sort of observation. But now a quick taste of what Solar Orbiter is saying, but only a, a quick one. This is, compare this to what we've seen earlier on. This is what we're getting now. We're looking at the edge of the sun here. We're looking quite low in the sun's atmosphere, and I guess you'd call it the chromosphere or the lower corona. Um, and it looks like hair on here. These are the magnetic field lines you're seeing, but basically if I run it as a movie, you'll see the sort of detail we're getting now. You can see the size of the earth there. <laughs> Imagine the data, um, the telemetry required to get these sorts of images back. And of course the structure you're seeing here, people are battling with trying to model and understand how the plasmas and magnetic fields can can work like this, um, causing and leading to things like flares and the mass ejection events, or even tiny little flares occurring all over the place. It's fascinating. To
to to to um, to see. But on a complete different scale, when you step back, going to the stereo spacecraft, these two frames are worth explaining because this is something that, um, just as an example, um, shows you what stereo can do. The two spacecraft here are on opposite sides of the sun. They're orbiting the sun. They're the same distance out as we are. So if you take the right-hand frame, you're looking from stereo B. Our instrument is called HI. It's a heliospheric imager. And on that frame on the right-hand side, then the sun is just off the left of it. You can hint, you get the hint of that because of the magnetic fields of the sun stretching out into space there with the brightness. That frame is 20 degrees across. That's so quite big. Uh, and you can see lots of stars down to 12th magnitude. That bright star on the right-hand side of the right-hand frame is you. That's the Earth. And this is a great way of seeing our place in space, as it were, because that bright thing there contains everybody you, you love, everybody you know, everybody you loathe and hate as well is also on that bright thing. But uh, we're all there. That's our little spaceship. On the other side of the sun, looking almost back towards the, sun, towards, towards the other, the first spacecraft, we see the frame on the left-hand side um, from stereo A. Again, 20 degrees across. In this case, the sun is off the right-hand side. This is sort of twisting your brain around a bit, I know. They're not quite looking back at each other. So that bright star there is actually Mercury. It's not the Earth, but put it there. So these two, however, they're almost looking from either side, sort of towards one another. Now, if I run it as a movie, I have to apologize because there's a comet that's going to try and steal the show and grab your attention, even though that's not really what I want you to do. But that's um, Comet Panstars, which in that uh, particular period in 2013, um, decided to come between us and the uh, the Earth. It kind of shows you, or, or suggests the Earth's quite vulnerable from, from the point of view of a comet coming through, but it was nowhere near the Earth, and we don't know of any that are going to be. Um, but quite spectacular to see, especially if you see the structure and the tail as well. But um, actually what I want you to see is the coronal mass ejections. The ones you saw earlier on, these clouds being flung out by the, the sun, you see them here from stereo. You're out, well out in space looking back. You've blocked off the sun. You can, you've can you got the baffles around the camera system so the sun isn't blinding the cameras at all. Then you can, you can pick out these clouds. Um, it's taken a lot of effort to do that, but it's it's possible to see them. And if you look carefully, you can see that some of them appear to pass over the Earth. In fact, there's about four or five of them in this sequence, and actually at least two of those do engulf the Earth completely. And, and that's quite significant, and I'll cover the significance of that in a few minutes. But these are unique observations. We're only just we've only just been making these now for the last um, well, a couple of decades now, actually, with this particular instrument and others are now being developed. I'm going to just briefly talk about where I come from because as far as the Rutherford Apton Laboratory is concerned it's a place that many people might not know but it's actually one of the largest government laboratories and it contains some of the major facilities that you wouldn't have at every university for example like some of the particle accelerators, supercomputing, lasers and so on. Um, one of the departments is the Space Science Department, known as RAL Space, and this is the flagship building, as it were. Um, so people should think of it as a national facility, a kind of or sort of the nearest thing we have to a NASA centre. Um, and I mean, that's what laboratory, the whole laboratory looks like. Um, it's dominated um, by a, a synchrotron the diamond synchrotron in the foreground, but there are lots of other things happening on site there. Um, and the department I'm talking about, of course, is the uh, uh, on the space side. But it's worth just looking at the history a little bit because it might um, might interest you, um, or you might even be familiar with um, one or two of the names I'll just mention. So there are three people I will mention. One of them is this chap, Sir Robert Watson Watt, um, who was um, who was in the developing basically lightning detection techniques, radio techniques. Um, which led to our first practical demonstration of radar in 1935. So this is the sort of thing I'm sure would be interest to you. Um, he was based at Ditton Park from 1924. Uh, that place became known as a radio research station in 1927, with him as the director. And the whole point about this, as I might as well tell you now, is that that place, that work, is one of the um, 
first elements of what became Ralph Space. Um, he was working for a lot of the time with Sir Edward Appleton, which is might again also be a name that some of you know, and others, looking into radio sounding of the ionosphere. Uh, given his work on uh, radar in particular, it is reported in later life he was pulled over by a Canadian policeman using a radar speed gun and um, had him quoted as saying, had I known you were going to do that with it, I'd never have invented it. Um, the other chap I'll mention now is Sir Edward Appleton. He wasn't actually working at Ditton Park, he worked with Ditton Park, I think he was spent most of his time at Cambridge. Um, but um, at Ditton Park then, um, the radio research station began to make regular observations of the ionosphere using an ionosonde from 1932. Uh, you're looking at part of an ionosonde there on the right hand side at the bottom. Uh, basically you're sending big radar pulses up into the atmosphere and seeing what bounces back down from the ionosphere, which of course is effectively the, 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 the uh, barrier between the, the neutral atmosphere and the and, and space, if you like. Um, so in understanding what is coming back from there and saying something about what's happening in the ionosphere tells you something about how active it is out there and what's happening in terms of sp well, space weather, effectively, what I was mentioning earlier on. But a little bit more about that later on. So in 1965, um, that lab became known as the Radio and Space Research Station in 74, the Appleton Laboratory. And Appleton himself had the Nobel Prize in 1947. And in 1979, 1980, that laboratory moved to Oxfordshire to become part of the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. But the long-term operation of that Ditton Park Ionosan continues today at Rutherford. So it's been going for, it says 90 years there. It's over 90 years now by a long way. Um, so we're keeping that going. We go back a long, long way. The other element was the space flight element. And this came from the Harwell Lab, which is actually next door to the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And that instrument on the top right hand side is Zeta, which is one of these fusion devices where they are trying to generate plasma, plasmas where fusion would occur. Um, um, so this is uh, obviously uh, the sort of thing we, we, we do nowadays, nowadays at places like JET. And the idea was to con confirm or deny whether fusion was taking place in the super hot plasmas they were creating. In a sense, it doesn't really matter what they were doing. They were looking at plasmas and needed people to understand what was happening in those plasmas and as a group led by Bob Wilson um, in 1959 onwards who were basically looking into plasma spectroscopy so they were lo looking at spectroscopic observations emitted by or, or light emitted by that those plasmas so they because you're not going to walk in there and actually measure it with a thermometer or something like that you've got to look at the radiation from that plasma to determine what's happening in there um, so they were able to do that and then realized that these instruments could be flown in space and look at the sun. So they actually participated in developing instruments to fly on suborbital rockets of the sort you see at the bottom right hand side there to look at the sun. And these were going to be in ultraviolet light, you guessed it, or extreme ultraviolet light, basically to look at the emission of the sort that we look at now in the, the movies you've seen. But obviously they, they didn't have the quality of images then that they could look at the spectra and were, the, were amongst the first to determine what was happening in the sun, how it worked, if you like. So a space hardware program was born. And that group became known as the Astrophysics Research Unit at Cullum, which is not far from Harwell, not far from where Rutherford is now. And it was directed by Bob Wilson himself. Um, and you guessed it, of course, they came together with that group coming from Ditton Park and between them became what is now known now as Ralph Space. So that's the lab again. and. Oh, knowledge on that slide, and you've seen that, that image already. Just to point out then that this timeline shows the mission that the laboratory has been involved with over the years um, and has, I mean, some of those missions contain a whole bunch of instruments. Um, so the lab has flown over 220 instruments in the time it's been in existence. Actually, I'll jump these few slides because I think uh, time is pressing slightly. Um, and obviously, it's not just missions, but those are the, that's just a smattering, if you like, of the space missions the department's been involved with. But then I come back to the radio side because <clears throat> the lab is also involved with ground-based stuff. And the sort of things you're seeing there on the top right-hand side, I mentioned the ionosonde, looking at the ionosphere. Well, there's more, there are more sophisticated ways of doing that now. We use ionosondes now to monitor the ionosphere. 
but instruments like that ice cap device you see sitting there are also using VHF and UHF radar systems to monitor and study in great detail what's happening up there in the ionosphere, in particular studies of the auroral regions and so on. Um, and as you could imagine by the image there, that one is actually on Svalbard, so it's well north, um, looking at uh, rural regions in particular. <clears throat> the lab is also involved with the Square Kilometre Array, SKA, which should be operational, so it's late 2020s, I guess that's still on track. Um, I believe they're 350 megahertz to 24 gigahertz, something like that. Um, and will be one of the largest radio telescope systems on the planet. The only ones that could compete with that would be LOFAR, which is on the bottom there. It's just one LOFAR station. That's low frequency array, which is 10 to 210 megahertz, I believe, where it doesn't even look like a radio telescope, um, but you'd know more than, about those than, than me. But I mean, no. Uh, whole load of stations around Europe for this thing. And basically it's a huge radio telescope system um, with these working together. So I think this is probably the last sort of topical area I wanted to just cover. Um, but in a sense, I'm a solar physicist. A lot of what I talked about is of course to do with solar physics and how the sun works. But I've hinted at the sun impacting the earth. And this is meant to be Venus, not the earth. It's a simulation, of course, but it's showing you how the planet is responding to the environment thrown at it, if you like, by the sun. With Venus, Venus's atmosphere even uh, does uh, boil off a little bit with the, with the uh, impact of the, the sun. The Earth is not quite so threatened because uh, we have a, a decent magnetic field. But the bottom line is, if the sun's going to sneeze, we will notice. Um, and uh, we get engulfed with these coronal mass ejections or particles coming from flares and so on. And we talk about space weather. I've mentioned before. That can be a whole host of things. It could be currents generated in anything that can conduct electricity over long distances. So it could be uh, generated in pipelines. Um, it could be um, power distribution systems where things will um, basically uh, you know, transform or might get burnt out or something due to induced currents. GPS signals could be uh, interrupted through ionospheric scintillation or whatever. You get damaged to spacecraft electronics. Um, there are communications issues with aircraft. So there's a whole bunch of things you could identify, um, many more that I wouldn't even understand necessarily, but there's a whole host of things where there are effects that are considered to be significant. And the point about this is it's become significant at a level that's noticed by the government. And in a sense, you will all remember, I think this uh, the volcanic eruption in Iceland that uh, caused havoc for flights in the UK and a lot of Europe, um, there was a reassessment of the National Risk Register, which meant that things that could have significant effects or be damaging in a way that might not be fully appreciated, if you like, should be should be reassessed properly and understood. And a whole load of new areas were assessed to be, uh, you know, whether they should be on the National Risk Register. And on this, you've got uh, measures of uh, you know, you may, somehow they measure the impact or possible impact in terms of its impact to our infrastructures and our society, as it were, against probability in the next five years. Um, and a lot of things on there that you expect, obviously pandemic is right at the top. Th things that are right, you know, top right are the worst. Um, and you'll notice that almost up there is severe space weather, because if you had a really significant event, it could be pretty severe. From a government point of view, they're more concerned about the economic impact um, in terms of things like um, loss of signals and communications, power, those sorts of things. Uh, they're not thinking about disasters that's going to you know, kill everybody because of flares coming through. It's not that kind of thing. It's more to do with the impacts on, on the systems and, and so on that we have. And they're taking it very seriously to the point where there is a thing called the Space Environment Impact Expert Group now that advises the Department of Energy strategy and net zero um, until December. In fact, I was on that panel. Um, and the idea was that if um, there was an event of some sort, which was very significant, that group would occupy, occupy a sort of what they call a sage exercise, um, which would even um, basically interact with a COBRA meeting and so on in, in terms of how the UK should respond to something. So this is science becoming applied in a sense, at a, even at a political level. And as part of all of this, um, the Met Office in Exeter 
actually now has a space weather monitoring and modeling uh, forecasting center, um, which um, is, is fascinating to see, of course. Um, and of course it's done in, the whole thing was set up in collaboration in a sense, because obviously uh, the Met Office is effectively taking on the, the risk, if you like, from uh, uh, the relevant government department and actually um, running this forecasting center for the community, as it were, in the UK. It's one of only two similar centers on the planet, effectively. Um, and clearly the Met Office doesn't run the spacecraft or do this, this solar physics in a big way. Um, so it's been a bit of a partnership as well. So we've been working closely with the Met Office since uh, prior to the thing was de you know, development of this, this facility. And a lot of the images you see there are from the spacecraft that I've mentioned. Uh, we don't have many space weather monitoring dedicated missions. So a lot of these are the science missions feeding data into centers like this. Um, for forecasting. Having said that, we are heading that way because the European Space Agency, for example, has a space weather program. I mentioned earlier on a place in space called L1. Now, if you look on here carefully, you'll find the sun in the middle, of course, but the Earth on the right-hand side. And that point L1 is where I said SOHO was orbiting and could look at the sun all the time. There is another space, there are other space missions there looking at the sun, monitoring the sun, even a space weather mission which is good. Well, the European Space Agency are trying to uh, develop what Stereo has done, uh, but as a monitoring tool to have a, a mission sitting out of what we call L5 at the bottom there. So it's a, it would be a mission basically following the Earth in its orbit, but far enough around to be able to look at the space between the Sun and the Earth in exactly the same way that we've done with Stereo, but do it on a proper sort of monitoring basis rather than the scientific one that we have been doing, because Stereo didn't stop there, it just carried on around. Uh, and that's a mission to be called Vigil, and it would be making use of this sort of instrument on that spacecraft uh, that, that we had on Stereo, which is uh, there's a close up of it, but I'll move on. Just to illustrate what this can do, obviously, we might recognize the picture of an aurora on the bottom left, so on the left hand side there. And traces for that particular event, you can see on a particular time on that top right hand plot from a GO spacecraft, you can see, I think it's protons, yeah, the proton flux going up dramatically as the arrival of one of these coronal mass ejections occurs near the Earth. Um, in terms of the solar wind arriving at the Earth, the plot underneath uh, the top one of those three strand, four strands there shows the shock arriving at Earth in the velocity of the solar wind and in the density. Um, and these things, as you saw, can have a very significant effect on Earth. We're into the last two slides now, I should stress now. And there is a coronal mass ejection on the left-hand side with the stars in the background. Jupiter is the planet sitting there, just sitting on the edge of the Milky Way there. But the cloud is coming from the right-hand side. This is one of these coronal mass ejections. But the one on the left-hand side is going to be a little movie again. Um, and it stresses something a little bit more. When you look at the sun with one of these heliospheric images, like the one from Stereo that we have, and that's where this comes from, all of these images, these two. Um, so I'm going to run this one. It's What we've done here is basically difference the frames so that you can highlight the changes. And what it shows you is, yes, you can see the big clouds coming out, but it's a continuous outflow of bumps and wiggles. I don't know what to call it. It's very violent down there in the inner heliosphere. Uh, and there's a load of stuff coming out towards us all the time. It's continuous. We're not in an area of space that's really simple in any sense at all or calm so seeing these aim these movies for the first time is quite an eye-opener well huge is that already isn't it? um so the front the mission i'm talking about that ESA, the european space agency are wanting to develop is one called vigil and we've been heavily involved with the definition of that mission and the rutherford appleton laboratory will be involved with that mission um, as it progresses over the years okay so I'm going to actually stop there and thank you for your attention. Um, I hope I didn't go on for too long there, but um, I'm certainly happy to take any questions if you uh, if you have them. I'm not sure I'd be able to answer them all if they're uh, too detailed in terms of the uh, the radio side, of course. But um, thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Well, Richard, thank our oh, thanks to you uh, for for delivering this tonight. We just said to you when we met a few days ago for rehearsal. You know, we we do get to hear about some of this stuff, but very on a superficial level because we're just mainly 
talking about how it affects our hobby and not the actual science behind it. So I think this has been a fascinating insight into the sun and, and maybe a better understanding for all of us uh, on how it affects our um, hobby. So if you do have a question or a comment or anything for Richard, now is the time to enter it, please, either on Facebook or BATC, and we'll be happy to read them to you. So the first question for you, Richard, was from Tom Miller. He's, he asks, any comments on the HAARP, H-A-A-R-P, sorry, H-A-A-R-P array believed to have ionised the ionosphere? Oh, dear. Um, that's not really my area. Um, when you say comments on it... Um... That's what he said, yeah. So no. any thoughts? I mean, for all of for the rest of us, I haven't heard of that. I've heard of HARP, actually, but I'm not quite sure where. So maybe could you just tell us a little bit about that? I can't tell you much about it. I do know about it a little bit, but uh, there are, obviously there are... I've mentioned instruments that, look, that monitor the ionosphere, uh, but there are also instruments that are active in trying to um, do things with the ionosphere, if you like, not in a harmful way, as it were. Um, but um, I, I can't really really answer that question. Actually, the, whoever asked the question should might 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 enlighten us a little bit. I'm afraid. No, well, we're not here. Definitely not here so, to trip you up or anything like that, Richard. And obviously, oh, that's a shame. I, I would be interested to know. <laughs> well, and maybe Tom, if you know some more about that, that we can. I mean, I have to say, I'm more on the solar side and the space weather side and impacts on Earth. At Rutherford, there are ionospheric people who would certainly be able to answer that question. And people running the ionosons and the ice scat instrument themselves would be that would be right up their street, definitely. But um... okay, well, there is something I think probably right up your street uh, because Tony M Zero TDK has asked, "What is a CME made of?" It well, it's made of the same stuff as the sun. So um, in the sun's, I mean, the sun is mainly hydrogen, basically. Um, but there is uh, some helium, but there are elements, everything, all the way up to iron. Um, you can find traces of um and of course it, as i said it's so hot it's all ionized so it's a plasma um and the, the whatever leaves the sun if you like as a cloud and comes flying our way as a coronal mass ejection is going to be effectively that so what you measure more than anything else will be protons and electrons they won't be bound um as hydrogen atoms um but you'll see you could measure traces of just about anything and they and yeah it's, it's funny we, we you often think of the sun as as a gas of course it's a gas it's a plasma um but i mentioned the, the spectroscopic instruments that we that we made for soho um and a lot of the emission line stuff that i mentioned that we, we used to measure what's happening in the sun's atmosphere in terms of the densities the, the flow speeds the abundances the, and so on and so forth uh, I think it's emission that's coming from things like magnesium, iron, sodium, um, neon. You know, it's, it's not the things you expect to find in the sun. Mm. Um, people don't think of those as being a gas, if you think it's funny. Uh, but it's exactly the same stuff. It's solar stuff. And of course, seeing as the sun came out of the same cloud, or we came out of the same cloud as the sun, uh, we're kind of the same stuff as well, I suppose. It's just that it's in different ratios and so on. But um, it's basically solar material, exactly as is. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, Ralph 2M0RHT now asks, when we look at the sun from the UK, how do we know where north and south are and how was this measured? Oh, you mean the solar north and solar south? I can't ask him directly, but maybe, yeah, assume that at the moment. And Ralph, maybe you'd come back to us and, and clarify. Oh, that that's, oh, yes, that's an interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> that's one where I'm totally spoiled, because if you think of the solar observations we make, we're in space, uh, we have spacecraft that are aligned with the sun, and they always keep sun, the solar north up and down and so on. But when I try and make observations from the garden myself with a telescope never looking through the telescope at the sun of course in fact you shouldn't look at the sun directly of course yourself even without a telescope really um i personally try to work it out from the sunspots compared to the maps that i've already got rather than go through all the complicated geometry of trying to work it out looking at the time of day and, and so on and so forth it's not the easiest thing to do but it, it's doable because if you know where you are your position and the angles and so on you can work it all out but it's not uh, it's not a, a particularly easy thing to do okay thanks yeah by the way he came back and said yes yeah, so 
that your assumption was 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 uh, correct and what he wanted to know. Thank you. Uh, Roger G three L D I says the solar cycle is eleven years and changes due to the flipping of the sun's magnetic field. But what causes that, and why eleven years? Do you know? It's funny because one of the most basic drivers of this came out a long, long time ago, and it was um, a very simple model where you just take a, a ball of plasma the size of the sun, make it simple, if you like, um, just have a field line that goes from the top to the bottom, and let it rotate. And we know that the sun's equator rotates faster than the poles, um, and, and it's graded between the two, as it were. So once, if you've got a line, a field line, if you like, from top to bottom, as the sun rotates, it will stretch. So the, the equator goes around faster. So what you've got will sort of be pulled in the middle to the point where it will sort of wrap around on itself. You end up with something that looks like a spring. Does that make sense? Um, and the point is you can only drive that for a certain period of time before it begin to break down in some way. It has to break down. It can't keep going. Um, and even some decades ago, people made predictions that um, there's only a certain time period that, that could go. And 11 years seemed like a sensible figure. It kind of fitted with the models that had at that time. Um, and of course, when I say it breaks down, if you imagine this field line being stretched out into that spring shape, magnetic fields can actually reconnect, which is a bit of a strange thing to say. Elastic bands break, they don't reconnect, do they? Um, but if you do that, if you had a a way of reconnecting. I don't know how to describe it quite, but if you've got two field lines sort of stretched next to each other and they're really close, um, and you've got this turbulent environment in the sun or whatever, you you can actually get two field lines literally sort of pinching off um, and simplifying this thing again. Um, and the thinking was that that's just like simulating the time when you get all the flares and explosions because you've got all the magnetic energy being released and all this reconnection means you result in and it ends up again in a nice straight line because it's all sort of um, reconnected and then simplified itself again and taken all the energy out of the magnetic field um, and miraculously if you do that you've got magnetic field line one field line again but the other way up um, so that's a very simple way of describing the the cycle um, and at the time people were talking about this, it was more a matter of saying, well, 11 years seems quite reasonable for this. <laughs> it's a very basic thing. But, but, and we know the sun is far more complicated than that, of course. But the bottom driver is that. It's the differential rotation of the sun. And it's sort of driving things to get more and more complex. It all breaks down with the flares and the coronal mass ejections, and then it drives up again. Um, and in doing so, it reverses the magnetic fields. Now, I don't know whether that explained it well enough. If I if I knew that question had been coming, I would have probably <laughs> shortened the diagram. But it's, did, did that help at all? Well, hopefully, uh, that's Roger. So if it did, Roger, uh, let us know. Um, by the way, you know, the previous question from Ralph about how you know where you are, um, Steve Webb came onto Facebook and said, if this helps, Polar North is defined as looking down at the pole and the rotation is anti-clockwise. I think I can just about. Get oh, I see in that sense. Oh, is that? Is so that I, I don't know if that's what he meant because I think Ralph did come back and meant, like you said, like you thought it was from the sun's perspective. But um, anyway, I, it's, it's just my job to read out the comments and. Well, feedback I must admit, I, I read that to me, and if I was in my back garden looking at the sun, how do I know which way up the sun is? Right, I think that is what Ralph mentioned oh, as well. Okay. But anyway, thanks. We're, we're all learning a lot tonight. And by the way, Roger, the question, the last question says thanks. That's fine. It really helped him understand the eleven oh, okay. point about the eleven that's years. Sorry. Now I've got a question yeah, from Jim Bacon, G3YLA. You may know Jim. Uh, really interesting presentation. Thank you. Is there any change in the content of CMEs during a solar cycle, <clears throat> and which period of the cycle represents the greatest risk for disruption to radio signals on Earth? Oh, that's two different questions there, isn't it? If I forget the second one, tell me, won't you? <laughs> sure, that's fine. The actual abundance of elements within the uh, coronal mass ejections don't really change with the solar cycle. Um, there can be changes for different reasons. Um, well, I guess you wouldn't 
if I, I'm not sure I could take, make a measurement to one with the, of one and what was in it, as it were, and say, oh, that was maximum, that was minimum. I'd use different things to do that. Um, so I don't think they change in that sense, in what they, the makeup of them, as it were. But they do change in other ways. I mean, the frequency obviously changes. There are more of them when the sun is active. Surprise, surprise. Um, when the sun is particularly active, they can be a bit more violent, meaning a bit more, you know, they might be faster and more dense, for example. Um, and maybe the association with flares, obviously, is a key here as well. And then clearly at solar maximum, you get more bigger, flare, more big flares. But you also can get a flare that at a coronal mass ejection or whether that can appear out of nowhere in a solar minimum period. So a single event doesn't help you. <laughs> um, OK, so what was sorry, what was the that, second that's part? OK. And the second part was which period of the cycle represents the greatest risk for disruption to radio signals on Earth? Well, it's, it's going to be solar maximum. Um, having said that, I will, I'll start by saying solar maximum, because certainly solar maximum, there are more flares, there are more bigger, more big flares, there are more coronal mass ejections. But I would also point out that a couple of years after maximum, we do tend to get some big events. The Carrington event was not at solar maximum. It was a couple of years after solar maximum. And there've been other examples where we've had big events a couple of years after solar maximum, nobody seems to know why. Um, there's probably a logical explanation, and I'm sure there are a few models, um, but I have not yet seen a satisfactory one from my point of view. Okay, thank you. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, I must, I must say I'm that good. Jim is one of our a team um, that does the propagation as part of the propagation studies team. Mm -hmm. um, for the Radio Society of Great Britain, so he's very interested in uh, weather. His, his his career was weather, but also in terms of radio, you know, in how propagation um, affects our our, our hobby. Um, and talking of which, Steve G0KYA, who's the chair of the Propagation Studies Committee for the RSGB, asks you this: the Met, of Met Office can only give us four-day space weather predictions. As radio amateurs, we need seven-day forecasts, ideally. We therefore use the SWPC predictions from the USA, but it would be great if we had better predictions in the UK. That's interesting. Um, the SWPC is Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado, and the two centers work closely together um, and have done from the beginning of the Exeter effort, as it were. That's an interesting question. Um, I must admit the the a lot of it has been driven by not only the, the government national risk register, but also the industrial input in terms of the power companies, uh, aviation, so on and so forth. Uh, and I suppose the pressure should be put on a little bit in some senses by making, making it known that other groups need other information. Having said that, the difficulty is if you're looking for a prediction of a coronal mass ejection or a flare, we are not in a position where we can look at an active region and say, oh, it's going to flare tomorrow afternoon and um, we'll knock out Swindon or something like that. Um, you know, we're just not that sophisticated. Um, a lot of our predictions are based on the fact that a coronal mass ejection, for example, has already started. And we can therefore track it to, or project, project, if you like, its track. Um, and of course, if it's on its way, there's only a few days to go, pull it the most. Um, so a lot of it might be driven by that. Having said that, when there's an active region coming round and it's been particularly active, and there's a good chance of an eruption that might occur when that region is level with Earth, as it were, facing the Earth, um, that sort of information, I think, is actually written into the Exeter reports, the Met Office reports, isn't it? If you actually read the, the blurb rather than the summaries, I think, um, they sort of say what's coming, but they won't necessarily put a likelihood on it because there isn't a, an event necessarily on its way or an event has occurred. It's more like a likelihood, isn't it? Um, and and you're kind of, you can't really predict it. You can't forecast it because we can't look at an active region yet. 
and forecast the fact that it will do something as I say in a few hours time I'm not sure that fully answered the question um, I, I get I'm guessing though that Steve may be saying why can they why there be seven day predictions mm. in the US but not in the UK no, I think I'd almost do if, if he's saying that they ought to be the same, I think I'd agree with him, to be honest. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But you think the science, from your point of view, probably the four days about right, I guess, from... And I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but, you know, there's maybe well, the most accurate sort of period that you... I think the point is, predict. at the moment, in terms of a coronal mass ejection, which is the main event in terms of the, the issues that, say, the power distribution companies have or satellite controllers or whatever... Um, they need to know there's a coronal mass ejection coming. Well, we know if one has taken off, therefore we track that. Um, and that might take a day and a half. It might take three days to get here, but it's not going to take seven. It will have come, it'll arrive by then. Um, so that might reflect an interest, uh, sorry, a difference in what is regarded to be the prime, or the emphasis, if you like, of the prime thing that they're trying to predict the prime sort of event they're trying to predict. But somebody from the Met Office should answer that one rather than me, I suppose. But maybe I would like to see the two do the same, to be perfectly honest. They, yeah. I mean, it should be running either... I mean, they do run the same software, uh, plus, plus um, yeah, there's some variations as well, but the basic codes are the same. Um, so they ought to be able to do the same thing. But I don't know. It might yeah. be just driven by the customers, basically. Yeah, well, I mean, we're probably not paying customers as such, but, I mean, Steve and his team do pr produce a seven-day forecast for propagation for radio mm. amateurs in the UK, and I guess that's why he's particularly interested and maybe that frustrated case, that he can't get more than four-day data from the UK. One question I would ask him is, he, has he spoken to the Met Office? I mean, uh, is that... Um, might be one, one well, thing to ask. maybe him or, or uh, Jim might come back on that because Jim uh, worked... The other thing I will say that might be of interest anyway, for all of you, in a sense, um, having come from Rutherford, um, the the chap who heads up the space weather side, and a lot of the questioning re relates to that, uh, is a chap called Mario Bisi, B-I-S-I. Um, and he is actually, his interest, he's actually on the radio side. It's actually um, interplanetary scintillation, I suppose, is the thing that he's really interested in. So it's not necessarily your area as it were um in terms of what what you do but um he's a radio man and he's the one who does um leads the interaction with the met office at this time so um i could put anybody in touch with him if they're particularly interested thank you i mean steve you has to just... follow up with an email yeah steve has actually come back and said thank you that was pretty much what he thought that was the first part of the question but regarding the second part uh steve g0koia says he has asked them and yes but they couldn't help. That's what he says. So unless you have any extra influence, maybe, I don't know. Um, if it, is it all right if I exchange email addresses between you and Steve in particular? I think that might be helpful. Do you yeah, mind? Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, but um, I should I would say to Steve then when you if you email me, um, I would ask you just to remind me what the question was. Then I could probably put you in touch with Mario, the chap I just mentioned would be a good thing to do. Lovely. But the other thing is I mustn't forget to uh, look up the Harper Ray and uh, find out the answers that I couldn't answer at the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. Well, don't worry. We've all learnt so much tonight, I promise you. Uh, Jim G through ILA, by the way, came back and said thank you. And just to say how much we value the Ionos Fund data in the amateur radio community. That is a lovely yeah. thing to hear because it's been so difficult to keep that funded and operational. It's well, amazing no, how funding agencies the world over in terms of observations, space missions, ground-based observations, whatever, like the idea of developing something, like the idea of launching something. Uh, the perfect mission wouldn't even have an operational phase. Um, <laughs> in terms of funding, um, you know, the, something that goes on for years and years and years and years is a kind of a nightmare to them because it's, um, from a funding point of view, it just keeps going. Um, so it's been a battle to keep the Anasons going. Uh, uh, Jim has set up a, a wonderful web resource called PropQuest, and I think he uses this sort of data as well for a lot of that, and that's free to the ham radio community. Mm. So, you know, we all appreciate all of the... Actually, the people at Rutherford will be delighted to hear that. Yeah, honestly, really <coughs> do. Uh, another question now from Ken Linney. <coughs> Excuse me. 
During the conversion of hydrogen synthesized to helium originally, originally the energy could not be re reconciled and did not balance. Uh, he says that I, he thinks it was Fred Hoyle who suggested that virtual particles were involved. Um, there was any scientist involved, can't remember the name. He probably means there, there was a scientist involved, can't remember the name. Does that make any sense to you? I'm sorry it's not familiar to me. I think I know what's, what's being referred to there. I mean, the, um, in terms of the fusion processes, and I mean, I, I didn't go into detail about what's happening in the core of the sun. And I mentioned a fusion, but didn't really expand on what even what that is. But yes, it's it's the process by which the hydrogen is being fused together to form helium, because it's so dense and hot down there. Having said that, it's all completely ionized, of course. But um, and it's at about fifteen fifteen million degrees. And I don't. I mean, the, the various people involved, um, certainly with the research then, and it's this is really research at the core of the sun and a lot of its theoretical work of course and it's not so much in my area but a lot of that work is focused on neutrinos um, and what comes through the different uh, processes that could occur in, in that fusion um, and there was um, basically if you like the solution took a long time to come in terms of there not being enough neutrinos or whatever um, and the, the processes were not being understood as it were and a lot of it boils down to, in recent years, the flavour of the neutrinos. There are different sorts, if you like. Um, and I think that was. I think that's correct. Uh, I'll have to go away and check my my, my own notes now. Um, and there's a greater feeling now that there's a it's better understood what the process processes are in the core of the sun. But yes, for a long time there was a big question mark, not about the fact that it was fusion, but more about the matter that um, a lot of what was happening it didn't seem quite right there were some things missing it wasn't quite as it should be in terms of the theory um so yes i mean that, that question does come from a, a firm basis should we say thank you a question for me if i may um you were involved with the soho launch <clears throat> excuse me you said in 1995 yes. um that to me feels like a long time i mean it's the best part of uh what 30 years really yes. is that and it's still delivering data to you now yeah not all instruments are operational in fact as our instrument on that spacecraft is not operational now unfortunately but it was a mission that was actually designed to operate for two years extendable to four wow and here we are yeah uh, <laughs> that's good value. Our, own instrument, our own instrument operated for grief how many years was it 19 or so whatever it was it was long beyond what it should have been but um, the thing that's kept it going is the coronagraph. That's the instrument that blocks off the sun and can see the coronal mass ejections coming out because that instrument has been key to the space weather side of life, understanding that coronal mass ejections are on their way. Um, and when SOHO was launched, I guess the understanding of that was that, yes, they can influence the Earth, but it got to the point in those decades where it was a kind of a we really need to know when those things are coming um and this is the only instrument that can actually see them um and it was years before the next chronograph was launched two chronographs were flown on the two stereo spacecraft but they they were doing something slightly different because they were going out sideways and it's been a long battle to try to get another one up by the earth as it were you know near the earth looking straight at the sun um so if you like you know, that that still is a bit of an issue um, but there are developments happening now, certainly, to get coronagraphs up there now. So that ageing coronagraph on an ageing space science mission has been the principal monitor for the observations being made by the Space Weather Prediction Centre in Boulder and for the Exeter Group as well at Met Office. Hmm. But it's been a phenomenal spacecraft, that mission. It does sound it, it, fantastic, 30 years nearly. Can I leave on one final question for you? as I often ask when we have a, someone with a scientific background. So you have just retired, you said, but you're still involved at mm -hmm. the Rutherford Laboratory. Can yes. I ask you what your personal ambition is in terms of what would you like to see in your lifetime now in terms of research that you left behind or maybe still involved with even? The one th one, is there one particular thing about the area of space research that you do that you're just dying to have an answer for? 
Good grief. <laughs> Maybe I should have given you notice of this. Sorry. No, you should have done really. It was terrible. <laughs> um, oh, dear. I, mean, I suppose throughout a lot of my career, I've been interested in how these coronal mass ejections take off. This might sound a bit technical, I know, but it's, it is it isn't because it's a bit like saying, can, can you predict a volcano? Can you, why can't that? It's a kind of a, why, why can't people do this anymore? <laughs> why can't they do it yet, I should say? And we've been having the same problem with the sun. Um, and a big argument has been going on for years and years and years about the relationship between flares and coronal mass ejections. Um, and in fact, we kind of separated them um, in the 80s where and I was one of these people who was in the right place at the right time and I was able to demonstrate that the observations just did not fit. The flare had almost nothing to do with the onset of the coronal mass ejection, but they seemed to be associated with each other somehow. That is a weird thing. It's a, you know, you've got this dirty by bit of explosion in the sun's atmosphere and sometimes related with it, a huge cloud comes flying out into space but one doesn't seem to cause the other. What's going on? <laughs> it's mm. a bit like saying every time you have an earthquake, you have a volcano. Well, how do they relate to each other? What's what's the situation? Why, why, why do they happen together or associated? And why are they sometimes not associated? It's, there's a relationship there that is a bit weird. Um, it would be lovely to know exactly what's happening. Sorry if that was a bit technical, actually. Not at all, Richard. It's just a fascinating insight into how you're still, even though you're retired, you're still thinking and still mm -hmm. wondering. And we're really grateful for all the work you've done over the years, for the Ionos Fund information as well, your part in that, and also just for giving us your time tonight to give us a fascinating insight into the operation of the sun oh. and how it affects our mm -hmm. hobby. And it's really given us an extra understanding, I think, of that. Really grateful. Thank you very much, Thank Richard you. Harrison. Thank you. Thank you. And I will take that message back to the Onison group, actually. Please do. Yeah, and I'll put you in touch with Steve as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thanks very much, Richard Harrison, MBE, Professor Richard Harrison. A wonderful talk, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who's learned such much tonight. Almost not going to sleep tonight thinking about all these wonderful things and those wonderful videos as well and images that we saw. Thank you very much to Richard. Just then, let's go over what's happening at the club this week. Just a summary at seven o'clock on Sunday, the GB2RS News on repeat at GB3MB. Monday night, Manette on GB3MB at 7.30. At eight o'clock, the 80 meter CW net and also that free webinar on the VHF contest stations on tonight at eight. And then we'll be back, Tammy and I, next Wednesday night, March the 6th, with a talk on becoming competitive with Kevin N4. Excel. Please keep in touch with your stu stories, your news, your pictures and everything else that we can share. But until next Wednesday, from Tammy. Bye-bye. And from me, take care of yourselves, look after each other. Bye-bye.